A new generation of Irish emigrated to America in the 1990s, more confident, more ambitious and better educated than their predecessors. They were among the first to leave by choice. They may have been born in Ireland, but they were made in America. Sean Conlon is a legend in Chicago. The city's not just his adopted home, it's his business. You know, I always believed growing up that America was uh, the land of opportunity, and that obviously came a lot from my father. He believed that everybody who went to America got rich, which obviously wasn't the case. But from the moment I arrived in Chicago and I saw the skyline, I absolutely knew that uh, this was somewhere where I could do something pretty special. Eleven years ago, Sean Conlon phoned his father and told him that he'd made his first million. No mean feat in the hard-nosed world of Chicago real estate. But that was then. These days, he's working towards his first billion. Conlon's work ethic and his business instincts are famous, and not just in his adopted city of Chicago. In the last decade, he's risen to become one of the city's most powerful developers. Okay, 2.8 million, but the guy's obviously a pig and he keeps coming back. That's it. Tell him we're done playing games. Okay, but tell him it's strongly. Stop being so nice. These days, Chicago's most eligible bachelor has an empire that includes the fastest growing real estate company in the city, a property finance fund, and dozens of prime developments all over the country. Soon, if his plan to build two towers in the city's business district is approved, he'll stamp an indelible mark on the Chicago skyline. Quite some achievement for the son of a Kildare bus driver. You run a $42 billion fund. A hundred million? It's a $300 million deal. Okay. Could you just close the door? It's a wonderful country, America, so it is. In 1990, a 22-year-old Sean Conlon, like thousands of other young Irish hopefuls, headed west in search of the American dream. Back then, that dream was the offer of a job from a distant cousin in Chicago. I met Sean when he first was, was coming to Chicago. Um, other people in our family had, had known him previous to that. He had sent a letter to our family saying that he, he would like to come and do some work for us. I um, own and operate apartment buildings in Chicago, so we sent him a plane ticket and he arrived. and. Uh, he actually stayed with me in my apartment. I arrived in Chicago at uh, the end of 1990, all ready to conquer the world, and uh, became a janitor. I was making $5 an hour, which my boss will dispute, but that was my wage. His duties would have been uh, taking out the garbage that the tenants put in the, in the bins at the bottom of the stairs, cleaning the laundry rooms, sweeping down the porches, um, vacuuming the hallway. Eventually, he got to the point where we taught him how to paint and he became a fairly good painter, but this was not in his plan for being a millionaire. I like standing here this time of year now and not having to worry about the snow. When I used to live in the building, I'd look out and I'd see it snowing and I'd be horrified. Do you remember that? I, but it's nice, the building looks good. I did a great job, didn't I? You did, it's all because of you. <laughs> Sean struggled as far as working, as far as physical labor went. I was terrible at it. I wasn't handy, you know, I, nothing. But he will tell you that when they allowed me to do rentals, I was probably the best renter, one of the best renters they'd ever had because I suddenly found something I loved. He nearly drove me crazy. He talked, talked, talked all the time. I said, Sean, stop it. Stop talking, Sean. When you grow up, I said, I hope you get a job that you can talk, because by God, you're good at it. OK, so this is a trip down memory lane. I used to live in this apartment. Obviously, someone else lives here now. Um, I remember when I first moved in, I couldn't believe how fancy it was. I found myself an old table in the basement or the alley, and I stole a McDonald's flag and put it on it. And I thought I had the nicest apartment in all of Chicago. And then I found a black and white television, which I couldn't believe it. I thought I was totally steeped in luck. The bedroom slash kitchen. I met Sean in 1990 when I rented an apartment from his cousin, Mike Donovan. And unbeknownst to me, Mike 
had told Sean about me because he thought that he and I might like each other. We started dating in 1990, and um, we got married in, uh, I think it was 1993. He had this idea that he wanted to become rich and famous, and then he would get a little more specific than that, but that was the main thrust. He wanted to be rich and famous. And so he decided that real estate would be a vehicle for that. I walked out that door there, I said, I, I've got it. I've got my future. I'm going to go into real estate. And you're like, you know what? I tried real estate. Don't waste your time. It doesn't work. You didn't have a set qualification where real estate in America, you do your course and you can get into it. You can get into it on a part-time basis. So he didn't have to quit his job. In 1993, Conlon got his first break in the business with Leader Realty, a small agency based in Rogers Park. And when I first started, I was still working as a janitor. So I would work from 7, 6.30, 7 in the morning to like 6 at night. Then I'd run upstairs, I'd clean the paint off me, and I used to wash my face with paint thinner because it was oil based paint, which probably wasn't great for my face. And then I'd go to the office, and I used to work till 1 or 2 at night. And then Saturdays and Sundays I loved because I could work from 9 in the morning till 10 at night on real estate. Within two months, he'd given up his job as a janitor and gone full-time as a broker with one of the biggest realtors in Chicago, Koenig & Stray. In the year that Chicago's property market turned from bear to bull, Sean Conlon was busy, cold calling. When I first started out, I didn't have any network here. I didn't know anybody. I talked funny. So I had to come up with some way to, you know, get an edge, and I had to do something different. And I wanted to chase land and do development. So what I used to do was I would walk around on the weekends and I would knock doors and I would knock lots of doors. And sometimes I would have to spend the evenings with people. I had a situation where I spent every Thursday night with a psychic for about two months to convince her to sell me her property to tear it down. This is, a, this is probably one of the first three flat buildings I sold as a broker. And you can see the contrast. It's like it sprung up like a sprout between the two uh, other buildings. It wasn't an unheard of concept. I, I don't want to pretend I invented condos. But in Chicago, people would build a building like this in Lincoln Park and do rentals. And as we were building the building, I got the blueprints, put prices on the condos that were basically made up and we marketed and we sold the hell out of them. So that was how it started. But then I aggressively pursued it and I protected my interests, you know, and I had that market cornered. The real estate market in Chicago was totally different at that time. There wasn't nearly as much new construction. It was actually only innovative builders that would take the risk to knock down these two unit buildings and build the three and four unit condo buildings. And he knew that he was networked with the builders, especially the Irish builders that would be willing to take these risks. Everybody told me that I was picked the wrong industry, wrong time. Um, I would say by 90, mid 90s, I was selling more real estate than anyone in Chicago. Within two years of joining Koenig and Stray, Conlon was one of the most promising realtors in America. In time, he'd be acknowledged as the greatest condominium salesman in the world. But long before that, he'd achieved something of much greater personal significance. I, I could say I made my first million at 26, um, which I was quite proud of. Uh, I called my father, which kind of all seems cheesy now, but that was a big point, and it was pretty young, I guess, in hindsight. He was incredibly charismatic and charming. If you talked to anyone in the town, they would say that the little bit of a thing I got from him was some of his charm. Um, but he was, he was also Irish in the sense he didn't say it much till, till the last two or three years. And then he was very, he was very expressive. He was, I think he was very proud. And he came out and saw everything in me, particularly when he wanted two drinks. And I'd be at home in bed at like 12. And he'd come home at three at night and wake me and he'd come up and he'd toss my head and he'd say, I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, I've got to work in the morning. Would you go downstairs to bed? <laughs> when Sean and I started selling real estate, 
selling $1 million worth of property got you a plaque from the Board of Realtors. Five years later, Sean was selling $150 million worth of real estate. Within uh, a five-year period, uh, Sean went from zero uh, to being the highest uh, grossing producer uh, in the country. And he did that in one of the most competitive markets. Conlon's phenomenal success came at a price. His commitment to the business was all-consuming and absolute. When I started working 100 hours a week, that became my mistress and that was what I wanted. I remember, you know, driving to my job and uh, having these screaming matches over the cell phone because he was frustrated because he could tell that I was, you know, pulling away from the relationship. That ultimately, Marcy became a casualty of my, my business, not my success, my wanting to be successful. Uh, but I think she'll probably tell you I make a fantastic ex-husband. Gentlemen, Hello, Mr. Nice, your see you. nice to see you. You look very smart. So Jenkins. Conlon's reputation as a man who can source any property makes him the broker of choice for the super rich. Matthew Pritzker is a friend, a client, and a member of the Hyatt family, which owns one of the world's leading hotel chains. Not your standard duplex either. We're talking about combining these two floors here. Right. Mm -hmm. It'll be about 13,000 square feet. Right. Yep. And we're figuring anywhere from 12 to 15 million dollars. And they had said because we're dropping down to 50, yeah. it's not a penthouse unit, so it doesn't have the Currently. 12 foot ceilings. Okay. So they'd be willing to redesign the building to, right. to put a penthouse floor on this level. We'll have them raise it to a 12 foot ceiling and make this a penthouse. 13,000 square feet. Yeah. You could get I can't wait. Bill. This is all one room. Okay. It'd be a pool table, a card table, and then right here right. is a drop-down movie screen. So they'll so redesign, to put it in perspective, they'll redesign a $300 million building so yeah. that you can have your apartment. Right. I tried to talk you out of it. It'd be cool, though, to be able to have, and I think for them and yeah. for, for, you know, uh, for the Elysian and for me, to, be, to have a very unique apartment that you can stand on Michigan Avenue and say, that's that one's, oh, that window's cool. By the end of the 90s, Conlon was ready to leave Koenig and Stray, surprising no one when he subsequently set up his own operation and brought his own hand-picked sales team with him. The company that he formed, Sussex and Riley, is the fastest growing real estate firm in Chicago. Uh, Sussex and Riley is a real estate brokerage company. I started the company in 2000 with eight employees. We presently have about 300, and we do in excess of a billion dollars a year in sales at this stage. Kieran Conlon, who emigrated from Kildare in 1996, is the director of new business at Sussex and Riley's Lincoln Park office. Needless to say, his big brother is a hard act to follow. The difference in our work hours, I would probably start at like 8 o'clock in the morning and finish at 6 or 7 in the evening. As for Sean, it's like 7 in the morning till it could be 11, 1 at night. It's totally, uh, totally the opposite. I tend to be a difficult boss because when people work 60 hours a week or 70 hours a week, I'm very disappointed. But I also now am way more successful and I work way less. I mean, I travel three months of the year. He loves to fly fish, whether it's in um, British Columbia, Alaska, Iceland, and I usually get the job of dropping him off. Uh, and uh, usually I'm happy enough about that when I get him to the airport because I don't get the emails late at night. Uh, I'm hoping I don't anyway, but no, it's usually it's been good. It gets a lot quieter when he's away. A few uh, magazines did articles on him, and they gave him the title of being the most <laughs> eligible bachelor in Chicago. You'd be lying if, as a boy, you said that you saw that as a huge disadvantage. Uh, we generally, men, like to take advantage of any angle they have to get their foot in the door. So I'll take that title and use it to the best of my benefit. Sean Conlon may socialise a little more now than he used to, but when the city itself is your business, every party is an office party. I was very conscious that Chicago is where it's his career is there. It's his work. He likes to keep the two separate. 
So although he does love it, he doesn't really avail of it as much as he could. Most of my socialising is in London or the Mediterranean. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. Even for a man more at home with bricks and mortar than crowds, it's still impossible to avoid the social round. Tonight is the Sussex and Riley Christmas party, and the boss has flown his sisters over from Ireland for the occasion. I have a really hard time with these things. I actually don't really get into them. Um, but I generally put in my appearance and uh, kind of, I mean, I stay with my group in the corner. Probably a couple of hundred people I have to say hello to and maybe try and remember a little bit. And that's kind of, that gets a little tedious. I had come to America to uh, make my fortune and it hadn't quite happened really quickly in my estimation. So I hadn't really gone home because I didn't want to be uh, embarrassed. But finally things started to work out and I flew home one Christmas and I uh, bought my father Mercedes for Christmas. And uh, I think he probably thought I was, you know, exaggerating a little bit. But uh, I went and I bought him the car and I think he was incredibly proud. So that was definitely the proudest moment of my life. When my dad first came out here, his first trip, he was amazed with everything, you know. He always said that if he'd been 20 years, 25 years uh, younger, it's one place in the world he would have loved because he liked everything about America. The dream was here, you know, and each time he'd talk to Sean and Sean would get very excited about telling him he's done this, he's done that, and Sean and my father were very, very close in that way. I was in Bermuda for my friend of mine's wedding. I got off the plane from Bermuda and my, some of my siblings were meeting me at the airport. And I thought, Kieran's either crashed both cars again, which had happened previously, or it was unusual. So they said, you need to get on the plane. Daddy had a heart attack. I uh, flew home and I went into the hospital in Nace. It transpired that my father needed a heart transplant. I said to him, listen, you know, and my father never asked for anything, but he said, you know, see if you can do something to help me. And so I um, came back to the States to try and figure things out, to see if I could fly him over here. I was excited. I thought, oh, I'm gonna fix all this. And uh, I got a call that uh, he had died. Sean was devastated. He, the way he dealt with it, he didn't talk about it for a, a long time. But he said to me last Sunday how much he missed him, and I was always going to miss him.